Kosick, and uh, I think we'll uh, get started now. Uh, just to make sure, can everybody um, uh, raise your hand if you can hear me? I just want to make sure that you can hear me and you can see the screen okay. Good. Okay, good. That's great. Okay, so we are going to talk about um, the the contaminant transport module in GoldSim today. Just going to be an introduction. Um, so I assume that you, uh, most of you have already used GoldSim, um, and um, and therefore you know it's uh, this, this discussion is going to assume that you know the basics of uh, of GoldSim itself. Um, and a, a, if that's the case, you know that GoldSim is a very flexible tool. Um, it's it's like a programming language. You just build very abstract. Uh, the tools themselves are very abstract, um, and it allows you to build a wide variety of models. Many of you are, are probably doing water management models, but it can be used for a wide variety of other things. Uh, if we wanted to simulate other types of systems, the basic Goldson framework is often insufficient. Um, and we realized that, you know, 20 years ago that this, this abstract um, flexible tool is, is very powerful for some systems, but there's some specialized systems where the equations um, are, are a bit more complex and you can't solve them using the, just the generic tool. Um, the contaminant transport module is one of those um, modules that we've added to allow us to model uh, a more complex set of equations. Um, essentially, if we're trying to model contaminant transport, we have a coupled set of differential equations that we need to simulate. And you'll see that the contaminant transport module is going to allow that. So the module is used to simulate the movement of mass, uh, typically contaminants, but it doesn't have to be contaminants, through natural and engineered systems. Um, so it, it, when I say engineered systems, oftentimes when we're doing a contaminant transport mo model, there may actually be some engineered component to it. So if you're building a, a, a repository, for example, for radioactive waste, it's a highly engineered system that all happens to be in the geosphere. We have to we have to move through the engineered system before we reach the geosphere. Um, in a mine, many parts of the system are obviously are engineered. Um, it's not just all natural. So what the contaminant transport module does is it produces predictions of mass transport rates, concentrations um, in specific media, water, soil, air. We can also compute impacts to human receptors. Um, we often don't need to do this for uh, many models, but some models take a, an extra step. If we have a concentration in water and soil, we can take the extra step and actually compute a health risk uh, to uh, a human who is uh, interacting with um, with those media. Uh, we're going to simulate. We're going to be able to simulate not just basic mixing, so mixing of, of of different waters of different concentrations, but things like solubility constraints, sorption, advection, dispersion, diffusion. Uh, we can do simple chemical reactions, including radioactive decay and ingrowth. Now, can we do this with basic gold sim? Well, you could do simple mixing with basic gold sim. You'd have to write the mixing equations yourself, but any complex model would be quite difficult to solve. Any complex contaminant transfer model would be very difficult to build in gold sim without the contaminant transport module. Um, I want to point out that there's two versions of the contaminant transfer mo module. One is called CT and one is called RT. CT is a subset of RT. So RT was built uh, primarily for people who need to simulate the transport of radionuclides. Um, it's got a number of additional features, such as the simulation of decay chains. Um, so what you'll see when we build contaminant transport modules uh, models, it, we essentially are adding a, a new set of elements to GoldSim. Um, the ones in red are only uh, included in, in the RT mo um, module. Um, the rest of them are included in the CT module also. We're not going to 
the RT module today, we're just going to focus on the basics and, and, and talk about the, the CT module. So before I actually walk through some examples and, and talk about how these models are built, let's just look at some real world examples so you can see what, what, what these models actually look like. Here's an example of a uranium mine closure model. Um, these, these, these teal colored objects are objects from the contaminant transport module. This um, model is simulating, uh, it, was, it was a mine that was being closed and it was simulating uh, the radionuclides um, in, in surface water bodies nearby, uh, resulting from the various operations of, of, of closing this, this facility. This is a part of a mine uh, model. Uh, it's a container within a mine model, and, and it points out something that's pretty important for contaminant transport modeling in GoldSim. So what we're modeling here is actually a treatment facility. And, and so you, you see here we have some tanks. These are uh, these are reservoir elements. They could be pool elements too. And, the, and these reservoir elements represent different tanks, a lime tank, an aeration tank, a pH adjustment tank. So obviously in those objects, we're keeping track of the flows and the quantity of water at each one of those locations. In parallel to those, we have contaminant transport module objects. These objects are keeping track of the concentration of, of various contaminants, in, in this particular case, metals um, that are in the water in those tanks. And we're actually modeling some of the, the processes that are occurring in those tanks. Um, ultimately, what we really care about is what's the effluent concentration. We have, we have some inflow into the tanks, and then we want to know what, we're, what maybe we're releasing to the environment or, or recirculating back to some other place in the mine. So this is very common. You're going to have a kind of two parallel models. You have your flow model, and then you have your contaminant transfer model, and, and they're coupled. The, the, the outputs of the flow model are the inputs for the contaminant transport model. Here's another example. This happens to be a, a radioactive waste site in which they've, they've buried some waste underground and they put a cap over that waste. Um, it's, it's in the unsaturated zone, it's in a desert. Um, and so water can, can leach the waste, it goes down through some soils and some rock and it goes to a saturated zone and ultimately to a well um, where somebody might potentially could be exposed. But mass could also move upward. Um, water isn't moving upward necessarily, but vapor, uh, liquid water is not moving upward, but liquid uh, water vapor can move upward. Um, and and, and um, the water vapor isn't going to carry contaminants, but other species could be um, uh, gaseous. Um, in a radioactive waste facility, you could have things like iodine and, and radon that are gaseous, and they can actually move upward. Um, we can also have plants move, plants and animals can actually move waste upward, and, and, and the contaminant transfer module is, is able to, to represent those type of processes. Most people wouldn't have to worry about these, but in radioactive waste, you do. This is a very complex radioactive waste disposal model in which there's a repository at great depth and some fractured rock. It's the, these, there are some highly engineered containers that are placed in boreholes that are surrounded by bentonite. And we can kind of zoom in that over here. In order to simulate that, we have to simulate the diffusion through the bentonite. Then we're gonna simulate the movement of, of these uh, radionuclides through some fractured rock. They're gonna ultimately meet a, uh, a fault, the fault's going to bring them up to a, a surface area where there might be some aquifers and lakes and ponds and, and other biosphere components. And ultimately, we're going to calculate um, a dose to, uh, to people who might interact with the, the waste. This is another radioactive waste model, a very old one. This is the Yucca Mountain Project. Uh, Goldson was used on that many years ago. Um, and and, and what, we're, what we have to worry about here is we have a repository in a, in a very complex geological system, fractured, tough, unsaturated. And so we have um, water flowing through the fractured tough um, and through fractures and, and also through the matrix. There's not enough water. Um, leaching things from the repository going down through the unsaturated and onto a saturated zone and ultimately to a biosphere via a well. Uh, this is a very long-term model, so we actually have to simulate climate change um, over time. So one thing that's very important to understand about the Goldson contaminant transport module is it's different 
than what you may be familiar with. So many of you may, may have built detailed contaminant transfer mod, uh, models using, you know, big two and 3D finite element or finite difference codes with 10,000 elements or nodes. That's not what Goldstone is about. And so when you're, when you're building uh, uh, any contaminant transport model, the thing you have to ask is just because you can build a large, highly discretized model doesn't mean you should. The problem is there's huge amount of uncertainty in contaminant transport models. Uh, there's uncertainty in the source. There's uncertainty in the key input parameters like partition coefficients and solubilities. Uh, we really don't understand the dispersive characteristics of the system because it's extremely heterogeneous in the real world. Um, as a general rule, our ability to predict concentrations is much poorer, much basically subject to greater uncertainty than our ability to predict flows, heads and flows in, in, in let's say, the subsurface. And so we have to keep, take that into account and, and, and realize that's the case. And that's kind of built into to Goldstein. Goldstein's not meant to build 10,000 node models. It's meant to build much uh, smaller more abstract models than that, maybe having the equivalent of a couple hundred elements or nodes, not thousands of elements or nodes. And that kind of leads into this, this quote, one of my favorite quotes about model building in general, that basically says, you know, a really complicated model is not a good one. In fact, a really complicated model may be a really bad model. And, and, and it's important that you take that to heart. Um, you know, a good modeler is able to build a model um, that's simple but evocative and, and, and captures the physics of what's really happening in the system. So in GoldSim, what this really means is we're building what we would call a total system model. Kind of we're looking at the whole system at a very high level, trying to capture all the interrelationships. We, in order to do that, we may actually need to build some detailed process level models, let's say a 3D flow model or, or geo, uh, you know, a thermodynamic um, a geochemistry model. Um, but we take the information we learn from those detailed models and we kind of roll them up, we abstract them into a simpler representation of the system that still captures the physics of the system. Uh, this also allows us to, to run large Monte Carlo simulations um, because the model runs much faster than trying to cobble all these models together. So given that little philosophy, now let me talk a little bit about GoldSim, and I'm going to give you some background on, on the contaminant transfer module. And then once we do that, I'll move in and, and, and actually show you some real models. So the contaminant transfer module, as I said, it adds a number of specialized elements um, to GoldSim. Um, it, um, it adds a number of elements. We're just going to focus on the ones we see here um, in this in this talk. So the, the the first thing you have to remember about the contaminant transfer module it's it's a basic framework. It's it's still generic, but it understands some physics, right? We have to under, we have to represent some physics. We have to conserve mass. It it understands decay and in growth, so we we can have decay chains. It understands the process of diffusion. It knows what the diffusion equation is. It knows partitioning. Um, it, it understands advection and dispersion. So it does have physics built into it into the equations it's solving, but it's still quite flexible. So you can build almost any type of, uh, of system, but the onus is on you to make sure it's physically realistic, that what you're doing uh, is, a, is, a, is a good representation of, of, of the system. The other thing to keep in mind with the contaminant transfer module is GoldSim has a feature where you can use arrays uh, of, of, of um, data and, and, and calculations. The vectors, there's a one-dimensional array and matrices, two-dimensional arrays. These exist and, and you may have used them in your other models. You don't have to use them, but they're often quite powerful to use these. Um, but they're required, they're absolutely required for the contaminant transport module. So the contaminant transport module relies on the use of arrays. And the reason it does this is because we're going to be modeling multiple species. And so instead of writing equations and, 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 and writing this, putting objects on the screen for each species, we're going to put objects on the screen that simultaneously transport all of the species. And so the outputs, the inputs to a, a contaminant tra transport module and the outputs for a contaminant transport mo model are, are, are almost always vectors of species. 
of the various species that we're simulating. So when we build these models, the steps are as follows. We're going to define the species, and we'll talk about each one of these steps in a minute. Then we're going to talk about the media that we need to model. And when I say media, I mean things like air, water, sediment, rock, soil. Um, then we're going to specify some transport pathways. And the transport pathways are made up of media. So an aquifer transport pathway is made up maybe of water and sand, right? And we're gonna, we now have to connect those transport pathways together. We have to tell GoldSim what are the processes that are moving mass from one location to the other. Obviously, we have to define some source terms. Where does the mass start? And, and, and is there initial conditions, some boundary conditions? And optionally, we can also now define how receptors are impacted. So we can stop after this fourth step and say, okay, I have concentrations at these various locations, <laughs> or we can take the next step and say, now that I have concentrations, I want to calculate um, some impact, um, a health risk or a dose on, on a receptor. So let's just talk quickly about species. The first thing you have to understand is basically Goldson does not understand chemistry. It's just going to say, hey, you invent a species. Here I've invented one called C and one called D. Tell me its properties. And its properties are quite simple. Um, we, we, we tell it whether or not it has a half-life. Does it decay? So in this particular case, I'm saying C decays and D does not. Um, and we, we give it an, a, a molecular weight. A molecular weight is, is, is important because some of the inputs can be either in um, grams. Uh, you know, I can, I, I can calculate, a, a, let's say, a solubility in terms of moles per liter. And if I put it in as moles per liter, I have to be able to compare convert that to, to mass because the equations we're solving are all terms of mass. But that's pretty much it. There's some other um, uh, features here that are only related to the, the RT module. But for basic goals, I'm just going to create a, a, a number of, of, of species and, and say, okay, I want to simulate these species. Now, I'll just quickly say if we're doing contaminant, if we're doing radionuclide transport modeling, Goldsim has a built-in database of all of the isotopes, all right? Um, these are known. We know what the isotopes are. We know their decay rates. We know who they decay to, right? So we have this built-in database. So if you are doing a radio uh, a, a radionuclide uh, model, um, which could be for, uh, for you know a disposal facility or maybe a uranium mine, and you need to track these various isotopes, we're, we're not going to force you to enter those manually in all the decay chains because the decay that can be quite complicated. Instead, we can say here's all the isotopes. Which ones are in your your source term, um, and or, or which ones might uh, might become uh, daughter products. We won't talk about this anymore. I just wanted to point that out that we do have this large database built in the Goldson for radionuclide transport. So once we define our media, now we have to define what we call these basic building blocks, and these are the environmental media. And in Goldson, there's two types of media that you you define: fluids and solids. There's always a fluid. Um, in the model, um, it, it defaults to the name of water. It's usually going to be water. It doesn't have to be. You know, you could build a model, let's say, of a of a fish, and you want to know how a, a, a contaminant was moving through the organs of the fish. Well, that's a contaminant transport model. In that case, the the main fluid we care about is blood, not water. But for all the models you're probably going to be building, it's water. Water is the the primary fluid. We call it the reference fluid that everything else is tied to. So we can we can add other fluids. So we can add air. Maybe you have a, a, a non-aqueous phase liquid in your model. We could add a, an oil, um, but we have to specify these these the fluids that exist in our system. And these fluids have physical properties, right? They have a diffusion coefficient. Um, they might have some solubility. So basically, what this means is, I can apply a solubility to the species in my model in water. So I can say, well, you know, this species has this solubility. We'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. This is a quite a simple way to capture, you know, precipitation reactions, but it can, you can often get away with this type of approach. Then we also have to deal with solids, right? So solids, sand, clay, whatever solids exist in your system, these, uh, the, the properties for these are, 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 are Appearance. I mean, wh why would we have to give a porosity? Well, if if, if the solid is part of a porous medium, we we need to know these things. Um, 
partition coefficients specify how each species partitions between water and this solid, right? Is it sorbing onto the solid as it's moving through the system, right? It doesn't have to, but we can tell Gold Sim that we're going to partition onto this system, onto this solid. Once we define the media, we now can define transport pathways. Transport pathways are the parts of the system through which species mass is transported or stored. It could be a tank, it could be a pond, an aquifer, a lake, a uh, soil, uh, an atmospheric column. Um, it, it's the it's the physical parts of the system where we through which we're transporting and storing mass. Um, and we define the properties of these pathways, and we have to tell us geometry. How long is it? How big is it? How much uh, how much water does it contain? Um, so obviously we have to talk about the physical properties of these pathways. We also have to talk about what media make up the pathway. So an aquifer pathway might consist of water and sediments. It could be, or, or water and sand, but it also could be water, sand, and air, let's say if, if, if the aquifer was not saturated. So we have to tell Goldson these things, and you'll see that here in a, in, in, in a minute. The way you should think about a transport pathway, it's a transfer function. We're going to put some mass into the into a transport pathway. It's going to be some mass rate <clears throat> as a function of time. And then the transport pathway is going to spit it out at some time later, and it's going to be delayed and dispersed. That's what, what a transport pathway does. Um, it eventually <clears throat> has mass moves through the transport pathway, and as it's moving through, it's delayed and dispersed. So Goldson actually has five types of, of, of these transfer pathways. We're just going to deal with these two today, um, the, the most powerful and the most common um, of the transport pathways. So what we're going to end up doing when we build a model is we, we build a model in which these various pathways are, are hooked together via what we call mass flux links. The mass flux link says, how does mass move from soil to the shallow aquifer? It's a defective process or it's a diffusive process. You know, we're going to have to talk about the, the, the physics that move mass from this location to this location. The thing about uh, pathways is mass, uh, species mass, the contaminant mass is conserved in these pathways. And that's what Goldson solves for. You're going to see the equations we solve. We're solving differential equations for the mass in each pathway. But the water and the media are, are moving through these pathways. Goldsim is not solving, the contaminant transport module is not solving for the fluid flow. You need to do that separately, right? So you build a flow model out of reservoirs and pools and other elements in Goldsim. And that, that's how you start. You say, here's how water's moving through the system. Now that I got, now I'm going to add my contaminant transport module and those flow rates and those volumes are inputs to the, to the contaminant transport module. Um, we have to put mass into a, into a, um, a contaminant transport module. We can do that in a couple of different ways. One is we can just specify some initial and boundary conditions in one of these pathways. But the RT module also has a specialized element called the source element that's meant to simulate engineered barrier systems, things like a drum or a highly engineered uh, a vault of some sort um, or some kind of uh, metal container, and 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 we we can uh, we can simulate that process. This happens to be a really critical process for radioactive transport models. We won't discuss it any further um, today. And again, um, we can stop our calculations at a concentration, or we can actually calculate um, a dose or a health risk to some receptor that we identify. Um, this is important in some models. We won't talk about this today. We're just going to calculate. Cost, um, concentrations. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's let's actually look at a few simple models um, that I've built, and so you can see what a, what, what these models look like. Um, we're going to start by dealing with one of the two pathway types I, I mentioned to you. It's called a, a cell pathway. Cell pathways are mixing cells. They're like tanks. Um, what does this mean? A, a cell pathway is has a single concentration. It's the, it's the same concentration everywhere in the pathway because it's well mixed. A cell pathway can contain multiple media. So I can say it contains water and sand or water and air or water, sand and air. The key point about a cell pathway is the mass is instantaneously mixed and it's equilibrated between those media. So if I define partition coefficients between water and sand or water and air, 
as soon as mass enters that pathway, it's instantaneously equilibrated. Right, that's the the basic thing you need to understand about cells. If that's not true, you just need to discretize your system more. So instead of having one cell, maybe you have four or five, right, to, to account for the fact that there's some kinetics. But the cell itself is instantly mixed, and the mass is equilibrated amongst all the media in the cell. When you hook cells together mathematically, and you'll see this here in a minute, it's essentially equivalent to a network of finite difference nodes. That's how we actually solve the equations. Um, we, we, we're going to hook pathways together by creating these things called mass flux links. Um, in general, the mass flux links that we, we typically care about is what are the processes that move mass from one cell or pathway to another? It's going to typically be advection slash dispersion or diffusion, right? Those are the key. There's a couple other special purpose types that I'm not going to discuss. But the bottom line is we're, we're creating mass flux links that tell GoldSim that we're moving mass from this location to this location via this process, this advection, diffusion. So let's look at a, a little simple example. And, and so in this model, I'm just, I'm, we're just gonna model two tanks, right? Make it really simple. So these two tanks have a, a constant volume um, and I have a constant amount of water flowing through the tanks. Um, I'm gonna introduce a, uh, a, a small amount of mass of, of contaminant named X into tank um, one. So we're just going to drop some mass in the tank one. And what I want to know is what's the concentration in tank one and tank two as a function of time. We just have water flowing through the system and ultimately it leaves tank two and we don't care about it. It goes to some sink. So we don't care about that. So let's let's look at that model. That model looks like this. All right. So in order to build that model, the first thing I have to do is create a species element and the species element says, oh, I got, I have one species called X, all right? I just made up a species called X. I have water and that's all. I don't have any other media in this system and I just have the, the medium water. If I go to the, the, the model, there's my two tanks. So that cell element represents this tank. This cell element represents this tank. This is represents the sink. We don't really care about it. But let's look at tank one. So tank one, this is a, a mixing cell. What does it ask you for? What does a mixing cell want? It says, how much media are in me? That's what it's asking. It's, and I'm saying, well, you have a constant volume, all right? Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna add some mass. I'm gonna add hundred grams of mass um, into you instant at the beginning of the simulation, all right? Tank two looks identical, except we're just not adding any mass. All the mass starts in tank one. If we look at tank one, we have an outflow from tank one. I'm gonna tell GoldSim that water flows from tank one to tank two at this flow rate, a rate of 0.1 cubic meter per day. That's all we're saying. And water flows from tank two to the sink at the same rate. So that's all we're doing. We can now run the model. These, what, what is the outputs of, 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 a, of a mixing cell? Well, the, the, the mixing cell has a couple of outputs. One of the output is how much mass is in the cell. And by the way, the, it's a speed, it's a set, it's a, actually a vector, but this, there's only one species, so it's a vector of one item. And we also can calculate what the concentration is in the water. All right, everything is constant here, so we're just gonna look at the mass, and the mass looks like this, All right? So what we have here is we started with 100, grams in tank one, it's slowly decayed, it's flushed, basically it's not decaying, it's flushing out of the tank, it's flushing into tank two, and then tank two is flushing. And after 200 days or so, all the mass is gone, it's left and it's in the sink. So very, very simple little model, all right? So let's talk about what equations Goldsum had to solve to do that. So what it did is when I built this model, I didn't have to write any equations, I just told Goldsum this is what I have. This is how much mass I have. This is how, you know, this is how much volume I have. Goldson took that information and behind the scenes wrote these differential equations. So this is the rate of change of mass in the first tank. It's simply equal to Q times the concentration. The concentration is M over V. Um, the rate of change of mass in the second tank is what's coming into it from the first tank, basically that same term, minus what's leaving it, right? And, and, the, and the rate of change of mass in the sink is just increasing, right? So I have three equations and three unknowns. 
Goldson takes these three differential equations and actually uses a, a finite difference approximation to solve them. So that's what we're, we're doing here. Let's go a little bit more complicated now. Uh, now in this model, we're going to have advection, but now we have partitioning. So I'm gonna add a second species called Y. It's also gonna be added initially into tank one. And there's also some sand in each tank. The Y partitions onto the sand, but X does not partition onto the sand, all right? Uh, an important assumption here is that when when mass is in the tank, either tank, it's instantaneously partitioned onto the sand. So it sees all of the sand. It's almost like these are really well mixed, but the sand can't leave, right? We have a filter there or something. So the, the idea here is this tank is completely well mixed. So any mass that enters immediately partitions between the water and the sand. That's an important assumption in this simple model. Let's let's open that model. And that model looks like this. How, how is it different? Well, I had to add um, another species called Y. And I had to add a, 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 a solid called sand. And the sand has partition coefficients defined. It's zero for X and five cubic meters for, for Y. Just to refresh your memory, what is a partition coefficient? It's the concentration, it's the ratio of the concentrations at equilibrium. It's the ratio of the concentration on the sand to the concentration in the water at equilibrium. That's that's the definition of a partition coefficient. That's why it has these these strange units. <clears throat> so if we run this model now, and we look at the amount of mass in the tank, we get a little we get a slightly different answer. Um, so the solid lines are are what's in tank one, and what you see is. Tank one flushes much quicker than, uh, I'm sorry, uh, X flushes much quicker than Y. That's because Y is being sorbed. It takes longer um, to, to flush Y out of the first tank because some of that Y exists on the sand. In fact, we can see that by plotting the concentration in tank one of the two species. And you can see the concentration of in water is much higher in tank um, for X than it is for Y, because some of the Y is partitioned onto the sand. In fact, we can see that. We can actually plot the concentration in sand, and the concentration in sand looks like this, right? So it basically says there's zero X in the sand, but there is a concentration of Y in the sand. All right, so that's that's very, very simple model. What are the equations we're solving there? Well, now our equations are a little bit more complicated. So now we have two cells uh, or two species. So now we have six equations instead of instead of uh, three. And we also have to now calculate the concentration a little bit differently. So X, the concentration is just mass divided by volume. But for Y, the concentration is mass divided by volume plus partition coefficient times the mass of sand in that cell. Goldson knows this automatically. I didn't have to write these equations. Goldson just understands these equations. So when I set up the model, it forms these equations. Now it's going to solve these couple differential equations by basically converting these uh, using a finite difference approximation to do so. So that's what we're doing, right? We don't have to write these equations. Goldson knows what these equations are. All right, now let's let's do a, a, a another um, example. In this example, we're going to have two tanks again, um, but and, and we're going to introduce X and Y just like we did before. X is infinitely soluble. So everything we've done so far, all the species have been infinitely soluble. There's no limit. But now we're going to put a solubility limit on Y. We're going to say water can only hold so much Y in solution. So it's got a solubility limit, all right? <clears throat> this is a very simple way to represent solubility constraints. So, you know, you may not be able to do this. You might have to use a, a geochemical equilibrium code, and Goldson can do that. Many people have actually coupled Goldson to geochemical equilibrium codes, but you don't want to do that unless you have to. That's that's a big step um, and, and a tricky step. Um, here, we're just going to take a really simple approach to solubility limits. 
So let's look at this model. And this model um, looks like this. What's the, what's the difference? Well, the difference is if I go to my material, there's my species, X and Y. I don't have any sand. But if you look at water, I've defined some solubilities here. And you'll see that there's two solubilities. One, X is minus one, okay? And Y is, is a number. Turns out the, the, the number is 10 milligrams per liter. So we're gonna say water cannot hold more than 10, gram, 10 milligrams per liter in solution. X is a negative solubility. A negative solubility tells Goldsum it's infinitely soluble. Whenever it sees a negative solubility, it basically says, skip all the solubility calculations. This guy is infinitely soluble. That's the default. In fact, in the other models we ran, there were solubilities. They're all set to negative one. So if, if we run this model now, and, and we look at, let's first look at the mass in the tanks. What we're going to notice is that um, X flushes faster than Y, right? So it takes longer for Y to flush out of the system. In order to understand Y, let's look at the concentration in the tanks. All right, so here's the concentration in the tanks. Um, and, and what we see here um, is we, we basically have a, um, uh, a fi our concentration is fixed um, in, um, in, in tank one for Y. It's set, and then it finally drops below the solubility limit, and then it goes away. Well, if I've fixed my solubility, remember the, the, the vector, the mass rate at which we're leaving this cell is Q times concentration, right? The concentration is higher for X than it is for Y, therefore X flushes faster than Y can flush, because Y is constrained by a solubility limit. So the equations here are really no different than what we've done before, except now when we're calculating the solubility, we have to constrain the solubility. We say, well, the solubility isn't just mass divided by volume, or if we had solids, it would be you know mass divided by volume pl plus a term for the partitioning. But we also have to account for the solubility limit, and we can't go above the solubility limit. So that's how we're solving those equations. Okay, so. We've just talked about advection, and advection is a, is a is a is a unidirectional process, right? It, it, we advect from the upstream cell um, pathway to the downstream pathway. But diffusion can also be important, right? Diffusion often isn't important in some systems because diffusion through water is slow. Diffusion through air is much faster, but diffusion through water can be quite slow. All right. But there are certain circumstances where diffusion can be a really, really critical process. Um, keep in mind, when, when we were calculating a, an advective rate, the MDT, it was a Q times concentration. But for diffusion, it's a, a constant, we'll call it the diffu diffusive conductance, times a concentration difference. It's not times a concentration, it's times a concentration difference. This makes a diffusive flux link bidirectional, it can actually reverse depending on what the concentration gradient is, right? The, this, this constant term up here, as you would expect, is a function of diffusivities and porosities, um, basically the, 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 the physical and chemical properties that are controlling diffusion um, is, is what's in this term here. And this is just the concentration gradient. So let's look at an example that does that. This is an example where I've, I've got a contaminated layer let's say at the bottom of a pond. It's at a fixed concentration. I wanna keep that contaminated layer from impacting the pond. So I put a cover on top of that, some a clay cover or something that is sitting on top of the contaminated layer. Of course, that doesn't stop the contamination from moving. I, I'm not moving any water through that cover. Let's say the it's got a very, very small hydraulic conductivity, but I can diffuse through that cover. So we're gonna simulate the diffusion from the bottom through this cover up into this, this well-mixed pond. That model looks like this. So in this case, well, let's go and say, look at our materials. So in our materials, I have the sand. This is what the cover is, right? Um, I don't have any partitioning or, 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 or solubilities here. Um, 
this these five cells represent the cover right so basically we're going to have to we're discretizing the diffusion through the the the, the process um uh, we're dis we're discretizing that that cover this would be equivalent to modeling this system let's say in a 1d numerical model and you've got five nodes or five elements that's what we've done here we've discretized the system if we don't discretize the system we've got problems because the mass would immediately, if, if I just had one cell here, the mass exists immediately at the surface. Well, we don't want that. We need to discretize it. We, the, the, in, in the gold sim, we, we talk a lot about how to discretize this. I won't go into detail. I will just say for, in this particular model, five cells is, is an appropriate level of discretization. So if I were to look at one of these cells, the bottom cell just has a fixed concentration. This is the cell that's uh, the, the contamination. If I look at any other cell, let's say cell three, first thing I have to do is say, how much water and how much sand is in the cell? Well, it's a function of my geometry, right? So I have some thickness of the, of the entire cover. I have a, an area um, of the bottom of the pond, a digitization level, it's five, and a porosity that tells me how much water I have. Similarly, how much sand I have is the thickness times the area times the, times the density divided by the discretization. So that's how much water and sand I have in each one of these cells. I don't have any inflows or offflows. There's no water moving through these guys. But what I do have is diffusive connections. So I have a diffusive connection from cell three to cell four and another one from cell two to cell three. So it's connected on both sides. And when we define this connection, we have to define some of the, some of the geometry. We're basically saying, what's the distance between these two cells? What's the cross-sectional area between these two cells? Am I diffusing through a porous medium? Yes, you are, sand. Goldson takes that information and then is able to solve the diffusion equation. So if we were to run this model and we were to look at the time history, so what I'm plotting here is the concentration in each one of those cells. So the, this is the bottom cell the, the, where it's fit at a fixed concentration of 10. And you can see that each cell slowly reaches this, you know, at, at some point, um, all those cells are at the same concentration. And, and the pond, even after 200 years, right, has not quite reached the, the, the concentration that's in the, in the contamination itself. And, and by the way, that cover was, I believe, um, uh, it was a half meter thick, right, um, with a porosity of 0.3. So diffusion is a slow process, right? That's that's the take home message here. Um, but we can we can simulate that diffusive process in Goldson. OK, so I've talked a little bit about cells here. I just want to point out cells can represent any geometry, right? You can put these cells together in different ways. Here, here's a model that's representing a borehole. So they they've built the they, they've drilled the borehole at the bottom of the borehole. They've disposed of some waste. Each one of these represents a cell. And then there's a lateral ring around that borehole that we also need to simulate. That's also represented by a cell. Now we're using some cylindrical geometry when we're defining the various connections. Um, but you can build fairly complex models this way. This model that I showed you earlier what we're modeling here is diffusion from a cylinder. So the cylinder is in placed inside um, a borehole. The borehole is surrounded by bentonite. And what we're doing is we're simulating the diffusion from the middle, from the weight package, out through the bentonite. And we're using basically 10 mixing, 10 of these cells to, to discretize that system. Um, here's a, a system where uh, I've got lots of stuff going on in, 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 at the ground surface. I have some river. I have a, some sediment in the river. I've got some surface soils. Um, I've got uh, a, a marine environment with some sediments. And there's lots of different movement between these mixing cells. These are, here's a schematic of what we're simulating. And we can represent all of that, that mixing and, and movement um, in, in our mixing cells. Here's a model where we have, um, uh, let's say I have a trench, I'm gonna move through an unsaturated zone, then it goes through a saturated zone, and I've kind of discretized the saturated zone as, as we're moving along, and, and maybe we have a well at the end. The, the problem with this particular model is that if I'm advecting mass through this saturated zone, we have dispersion going on. 
Well, you might have noticed when we looked at mixing cell, there is no input for what the dispersivity is. But we will get dispersion here. We're going to get dispersion because we're going to get numerical dispersion as we move along here. But that's not very nice. We don't want to have numerical dispersion um, because it's um, we, we want to make sure the numerical dispersion is is not too large and is not uh, doesn't dwarf our actual dispersion. So we wouldn't model this type of system like this. Instead, we would use a different type of element. And this is called an aquifer element. And an aquifer element solves the one-dimensional advection dispersion equation. And here you see I've replaced it in the unsaturated zone and the saturated zone. So what is this aquifer pathway? What it does is it solves a one-dimensional advection dispersion equation. And it does it using finite differences. Right, but we don't. We it it it, it specifically solves for the disperse for the dispersion, the longitudinal dispersion in this pathway. So let's look at a simple example here. This will be the last example we'll look at. I have a cylinder that I'm just it's a horizontal cylinder. It's filled with water and sand and saturated. I'm going to push water through this cylinder at a constant rate. I'm going to add chlorine and or uh, two species. I'll call them chlor uh, chloride and organic at a constant rate on the upstream uh, side, the, the organic partitions onto the sand, the chloride does not. I wanna know what the breakthrough curve out the back of this, of this cylinder is. So I'm gonna simulate this system using a, an aquifer element. So our, let's look what that aquifer element looks like. So the aquifer element looks like this. It basically says, how long am I? Well, the cylinder is five meters long. What's my area? Well, it's that area. It's a cross-sectional area right there. It's a square meter. What's my dispersivity? Here, I'm explicitly telling Goldsim, this is the degree of longitudinal dispersivity I have. Here, I've defined it as 10% of the aquifer length. We'll come back to this number here in a minute. W am I filled with something? Yes, you're filled with sand. Am I saturated? Yes, your saturation is one. Here, I'm putting in a rate a constant rate of 10 grams per year of, of both of uh, those two species, right? Number of cells says, I'm telling Goldsim, you, when you solve this, I want you to discretize this into 10 finite difference nodes. I need a certain number of nodes in order to capture this dispersivity properly. If I had a small number of nodes and it wasn't big enough to capture this dispersivity, Goldsim would tell me, he says, I can't simulate that dispersivity, I need more cells. 10 is enough in, in this particular case. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this model and I'm gonna look at the mass leaving the end of, of this guy. And what we see here is there's chloride ion and there's organic. The organic was, had a partition coefficient, the sand, so it's retarded. In fact, I defined the partition coefficient in such a way so I got a retard, retardation factor of about two, right? So that's what's breaking out at the end of this column. All right, so in a real model, we're going to combine these cells and aquifer elements together to 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 calculate to create complex systems. That's what I did here. I had some cell elements. These were aquifer elements, right? The unsaturated soil, the unsaturated rock, the saturated zone, all represented using aquifer aquifer elements. As I said, we're going to couple our flow and transport models together. So. If the flow is steady, obviously you don't need to model the flow system. You're just putting in constants. And in this model, I, I all my examples were steady state flow, but they don't have to be. You can model transient flow through these systems. And in that case, you have to have a separate flow model that's keeping track of what the flow rates and volumes are. So I've gone through this pretty quickly, all right? Um, and I've I've only shown you very simple models. Right. So one thing I want to point out is a realistic Goldson model might have a hundred or two hundred of these objects in it, but it's not going to have a thousand or ten thousand. Right. It won't have five. Right. But it's going to have fifty or a hundred of these. So our level of discretization is not really high, but we can build extremely complex models. I mean, Goldson is used to model very complex geosphere systems for radio, uh, radioactive waste disposal. So you can you can build a very complex model. We didn't we didn't discuss everything here. So we didn't discuss the 
a number of things we discussed, such as you, you can you can transport mass on suspended particulates. Goldson uh, provides that. We can do some water treatment. We can actually say when when mass enters this particular cell, we're going to say remove 98% of the zinc and and you know 95% of the iron when it moves on. So you can try to simulate a treatment process. Um, there's other tr transport mechanisms that are a little bit more complex than evection and dispersion. Let's say tra um, plant transport. We can model matrix diffusion. So matrix diffusion is is a process that occurs when you're moving contaminants through fractured rock. Um, essentially, can diffuse into the into the matrix as it's moving. We can model that process. We can link Goldsim to an external transport co code. So if if you had a part of your model that you needed to model in great detail, you can tell Goldsim and to couple that that code directly into into Goldsim. And as I said, we can simulate complex source terms. So the take home message here is Goldsim is complex and powerful, um, but you can you can create very complex multidimensional models um, just using these small pieces that I've I, I've I've shown you. The pieces themselves are are zero or one dimensional. Cell is basically zero dimensional or aquifer is one dimensional. But by connecting together one zero and one dimensional systems, you can build a very a two and three D dimensional system very easily. As I said, we're not intended to build highly discretized models, right? We're trying to um, and we would strongly argue that there's so much uncertainty in these models, it's inappropriate to, to have them highly discretized. We have a lot of uncertainty in our source terms and our part partition coefficients and our solubilities and our dispersivities. There's so much uncertainty. It's it's inappropriate in many cases to, to build very, very highly discretized models. How do we learn this? And this is the, 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 the key point. How do we end up learning how to use Goldson? Um, obviously, we have a user manual like we do for basic goals, and we have a lot of examples in a model library. But most importantly, we're in the middle of building an online course. Um, this online course is similar to the online course that we've built for basic gold sim, um, but it, <clears throat> it focuses only on the, um, the contaminant transport module. Um, these are the chapters in the course. Um, I've got about three more units to build. Um, we're going to release a major new version of GoldSim here in a couple months, so uh, um, I've had to put this aside. But my goal is to revisit this, and by the end of the year, have this this free online course online. And and I um, and I strongly uh, encourage you if you want to learn how to use GoldSim, take this course. Uh, this I've been working on this for almost two years, so this is a very detailed. It's got like 60 example models, um, lots of discussion. Uh, um, uh, of not just about Goldson, but about contaminant transport modeling in general. Um, so I think it'll be a, a great way. It'll take you three or four days to go through the course. I mean, that's what it's going to take, but you don't have to do it all at once. You can you can do it slowly and and spread it out. But I uh, when when this is available, we'll we'll announce this, and, and I highly recommend uh, people to go here. Um, We've got a, a bit of a big group, so I'm not going to take questions live here, but what I will do is I encourage you to uh, contact us if you have any questions. Send me an email, send it to our support desk, um, and we're happy to discuss um, the contaminant transport module or, or, or any other thing with you. Um, this webinar will be posted um, in a, a day or two to our website along with those example models. Um, so we'll, we'll post the PowerPoint, we'll post um, the, the, this, this recording, um, this little video, and we will also uh, post the example model. So I encourage you um, to, to download that if you want to share it with your colleagues. Okay, uh, thanks for your time and, and, uh, and have a good day.